Good morning. Let's just start uh, with the new topic today, and uh, that is uh, flexure mechanisms. So till now we have talked about uh, controlling controlling degrees of freedom, and uh, why you see here is uh, topic number three is uh, we haven't uh, started uh, the first topic which was which is generally uh, designed for stiffness. But we have enough background because uh, in most of the UZ curriculum, we study uh, about the stiffness analysis and uh, uh, in uh, mechanics of material or in design, uh, those things are uh, mostly covered. So uh, there is uh, no problem in following the uh, lectures, uh, which is based on the controlling degrees of freedom and then for flexures, okay, uh, that will be required. But anyway, we have a uh, enough background, and we'll come come back to that, and maybe with a uh, uh, with a slightly different flavor, we will try to introduce uh, uh, some uh, new concepts or the concepts which are uh, uh, important from a design point of view, or particularly with respect to precision. So, uh, after controlling degrees of freedom. I think flexure mechanism is uh, the obvious uh, follow-up chapter, and uh, what you realize that uh, is the is the embodiment. And uh, there are other uh, definitely there are other advantages why we go for flexures, but they are very much related, and we'll see. So uh, by now you might have realized. Uh, what is uh, flexures or uh, what is uh, when we talk about flexure mechanisms what is all about and uh, in principle it's mainly the uh, stiffness the lower stiffness part the compliance part uh, which uh, plays an uh, important role here and uh, many times it's also called compliant mechanisms or uh, very crudely, you can also say elastic mechanisms. Uh, so in the past, it was called elastic mechanisms. Then people have started talking about uh, compliant mechanisms. Uh, flexures, many times it's a referred to because it's a related to bending. So most of the deformations are because of the uh, bending deformations. You will see uh, slowly. Uh, okay, torsional stiffness, many times uh, we talk about. But uh, you can very much related, uh, relate why flexures name is there, right? So uh, it's, it's, there is uh, no uh, kind of uh, conventional revolute joints or any kind of uh, joints what we have. So usually in the uh, conventional design, we have revolute joints, we have bearing surfaces, right? Uh, and there is a physical contact and uh, there, there are friction involved because of that. Here, mostly it's because of the elastic deformations. So any motion, any relative motion between the two components, what we are getting here, is all because of elastic deformations. So they can happen locally or it can be distributed over a length. And therefore, we have like uh, distributed compliance or we talk about uh, um, uh, what you call is uh, located. So there uh, is uh, just a uh, flexure embodiment of uh, rigid body uh, mechanisms. But anyway, uh, I think uh, what, what you observe here, there are a few examples just to uh, refresh and uh, to be aware of. Okay, here uh, you see uh, it's, it's a mechanism to get a very large uh, rotations. But there are no, uh, it's all elastic mechanisms, all flexures. So you see uh, leaf springs, four day leaf spring kind of setups. Here again, you have a whole mechanism uh, design. And uh, for the revolute joints, for one axis uh, rotation, you don't have a revolute pairs here. What you see, they are cross, cross hinges, you call, call it. And again, it's, it's uh, leaf springs and uh, wires you can see and they can provide you that rotational degree of freedom. So it's again uh, elastic uh, deformations. And uh, yeah, the range of motion is not very small. So although it's limited in this kind of applications, but still you can get a, a range which, uh, which uh, lets us uh, 
use this kind of setup even in conventional designs uh, for a very uh, miniature application names and memes kind of application or where we are uh, designing or handling uh, micro objects uh, talking about the cells uh, manipulation of cells or atoms or even uh, designing new kind of sensor or actuators so for instance uh, your uh, accelerometer gyro gyroscopes all those things uh, they are built in a chip and uh, this is what you have inside so everything is, is a mechanism complete mechanism built uh, using the uh, silicon uh, so design with silicon you can uh, call it many times it's referred to here uh, again uh, there are certain applications you can see a lot of uh, uh, leaf springs so a lot of flexure mechanisms and many times where you need a very uh, controlled motion and you don't want any kind of hysteresis or any kind of uh, uh, problem because of the friction then you uh, you go for monolithic design so single design but then all the links everything is in, in one body and then you machine it out the rest of the material and you get uh, flexure mechanisms so this is very much like uh, you, you can uh, you can look into and whenever you search you can find this kind of uh, design these days so don't get over overwhelmed with, with that i think of course uh, after this uh, course you should be able to appreciate and maybe uh, in future you will be able to design new uh, kind of machines or components or modules uh, using uh, these concepts. So uh, why flexure mechanisms? Huh? And uh, so, okay, controlling degrees of freedom uh, is one thing and we talk about uh, kinematic designs and there are a lot of, uh, we talk about uh, ball in uh, weave, ball on flat, those kind of things. But then why we are going for flexures, right? So like monolithic designer. So one of the th key thing is the miniaturization. So, uh, with the with the very small sensors, with the very small uh, actuators, sensors on board, or any kind of uh, uh, devices, the small devices which can fit into a uh, small uh, uh, platform. So, like uh, um, these de uh, these days, uh, the devices can be of the palm size or even smaller. Sometimes it can and go inside the body as well and the entire thing can be in one chip so if you want to design something at, at that level then of course you cannot use nut bolts and uh, bearings and uh, the, this normal uh, components and of course this is a physical system so you still need a mechanical design you will still need a certain degrees of freedom so how to get it so then best idea is to design you know, on silicon, right? And then, uh, depending on the requirement, we provide that degrees of freedom. And just by manipulating the stiffness uh, or working with the stiffness in different direction, we can get a very good mechanism, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mechanism which can deliver the work required, which, which will give us the specification what is desired. So miniaturization is one of the key driver, I would say. Of course, the related things are like, uh, there is no friction involved, so it can uh, work anywhere and uh, means, uh, uh, maintenance and those things are not issues. The, uh, those issues can be avoided. So uh, even in a vacuum environment, it can work uh, very nicely. Uh, so whether a space application or uh, in, in a vacuum environment or in uh, kind of uh, like uh, uh, processes where uh, it has to work in vacuum, they, they can be easily implemented. Of course, the key idea is also controlling degrees of freedom. So what we covered previously and talking about certain degrees of freedom and how to uh, provide the constraints so that we get the desired motion. So. These are the uh, main driver, I would say, and that's how like uh, it has started. But I think the last two, friction, no friction, and the controlling degrees of freedom. 
uh, they also drive this uh, uh, this uh, school of thought and uh, very much it can be like uh, used in uh, normal applications as well uh, of course there are certain limitations uh, because the way it's designed because the way it, it works so of course the stroke is limited it cannot be infinite so normal uh, suppose revolute joints okay is they are bearing surfaces and they can keep on rotating here you can have a certain degree uh, means it can rotate only uh, like uh, 30 degree 40 degree maybe up to 60 degrees uh, but it's very much limited uh, maybe you can get higher maybe higher than 30 degree but then uh, it has to be in series or you have to come up with a very uh, uh, innovative idea and then we may have to couple uh, different stages uh, but most of the time is uh, limited to only few degrees rotation wise displacement wise also is uh, very much limited and then it can't be i think uh, in in macro domain it can be hardly plus minus five uh, mm uh, but i think uh, in the in a micro range it can go to uh, microns or even nano so very small strokes but uh, if uh, the strokes are limited and uh, what you see in most of the applications uh, the larger stroke we can always have a, a, a normal uh, components uh, the, um, mechanical components usual uh, co components we can use to get a very large motion very large uh, larger strokes but to get a uh, very high accuracy or repeatability then we can limit it to the limited stroke and in, uh, that's where uh, these these concepts will be very relevant and then you will find that uh, it's very nice to work with flexures uh, at that level so wherever we have limited stroke and uh, we, which might be true in many cases that the strokes are only are uh, means small the stroke is small and uh, most of the time we, we are working in that range so not necessarily we have to go for larger and then it is uh, very much we can use uh, flexure mechanisms the stress uh, is a general belief that okay it's not going to work and there will be a lot of the stresses built because the geometric structure there are certain uh, sudden change abrupt changes so what we study in normal design is is completely different and uh, we we find that there are abrupt changes in the design uh, in the geometry and we'll talk about the stress concentration and other issues but the thing is that that's where uh, our our role the role of a mechanical engineer comes into into picture and uh, knowing that okay there will be stresses there are the strokes will be limited uh, we have to design in a way that uh, for the given uh, given range of motion, the stresses may not go high. We take care of the normal stresses, but at the same time, we also talk about the fatigue applications, right? So if it's a dynamic application, we have to also talk about uh, uh, fatigue loading and uh, the failure because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, other thing is the stress and energy. So since it's an elastic mechanism, what happens is always loaded so the stiffness is always working against and even if it's a compliant direction and uh, uh, we are driving it we are actuating in that direction the motor the actuator has to be powered on all the time because we have to work against the stiffness right so certain stiffness how it doesn't matter how low it is but it still is there so we have to work against it and uh, there will be energy storage so uh, there are certain limitations but the thing is if it's a design in a in good way and we take care of uh, this uh, energy concept or stiffness actually we, we can use it uh, is uh, in a positive way we can uh, use it as an energy storage thing we can uh, use a perfectly balanced system so we can balance it really well so that uh, it also works as an energy releasing mechanism in the other half. So suppose if it works in a cyclic way, then uh, uh, it, it, it can be balanced and then we can 
uh, minimize the maximum torque required for moving the mechanism. So we'll also talk about that. And uh, I myself have worked, uh, worked in that area. So I have a few examples I can show you later. So, but be aware of that, that when you are working with the flexion mechanisms, the strokes are limited, uh, it's prone to stresses. So a stress buildup will be there. So you have to take care of that. And there will be a stiffness and energy, uh, elastic energy stored. So you, you have to use it or mitigate it, depending on how, how you want to uh, implement it. So this is one of the example. So it's a torsion beam, what you see here. And it's uh, just a, a mirror and it can um, rotate very fast and it's inside a chip. So this is one of the application. Uh, what I said that uh, in the analysis of uh, this kind of uh, uh, flexion mechanism, what you realize that uh, fundamentally or uh, the, the basic uh, mathematics of physics, what we will be working on it, they are very simple. And uh, most of the things are covered in undergraduate level. So we'll just go through it. And as I said, it's mostly bending. So we will talk about bending and maybe just a cantilever kind of thing. So uh, very simple. So what you see here is uh, cantilever, right? Cantilever beam and then uh, suppose it's uh, supported, clamped at one end, uh, other end. What you are applying here is uh, moment force and uh, with the moment uh, what you have is uh, uh, just give me a second now huh? or maybe we'll continue okay. so what you see here is a moment and uh, then the rotation at the end and uh, generalized force and there will be a deformation so capital f is the force applied at the tip and the small f is the uh, displacement along that direction. Similarly, you have a moment, bending moment applied at the tip, and then you have the phi deformation. So uh, just write uh, that basic formulation. So d2y by dx square. So here it will be df dx square. So uh, it's related. And uh, what we calculate most of the time is the bending moment. So mx is the bending moment at particular uh, instance. So at, at, at X, what will be the bending moment? And then, so EI, E by EI, and then, okay, there will, uh, if you take uh, any cross section at X, so it's F, L minus X, so L is the total length plus M, right? So it's in the same direction, so they will be added. And then we start integrating, so we integrate once, df by dx and then we have the proportionality constant uh, integration constant here and then again we uh, integrate and we get f displacement so df by dx is your slope uh, so how it has deformed and f is the displacement at any point x and then there are two constants c1 and c2 and uh, you uh, you must remember that uh, how to uh, get this uh, constant so basically we then uh, apply the boundary conditions so the boundary conditions are df by dx at this point at the clamp point at x equal to zero the slope is also zero and displacement is also zero so when you apply you will get c1 and c2 both equal to zero uh, what i expect that you should be able to get this one so what will be the displacement net displacement because of uh, uh, the two moment, uh, two forces. So two forces, your F and M. So in general, when we call forces, it means force and moments both, right? So uh, F and M. So what will be the force and phi? And I think uh, one should be able to write in a matrix form here. So uh, it, in matrix form, if you want to write it, I think maybe exercise for you uh, and uh, do it uh, do it later. So just give me a second. I have to connect. Uh, yes. So so if you have this, I I would like you to write so. 
usually uh, what is there f equal to if you want to write in a matrix form so a vector this is the stiffness matrix and this is the displacement so you should be able to uh, give me the stiffness matrix f is here then if I, I want to write it will be simply f is like f and m in this case so it's a planar case on the 2d we are talking about and this is two by two matrix which is called c and then you have displacement is f and phi so uh, i would like you to derive what is c huh? get these components so maybe you walk from here and then uh, so just work on this derivation and you should be able to tell me so what you re uh, realize here is very simple and uh, it's just uh, from a basic cantilever equation and then uh, you get uh, get the formula right what happens suppose uh, uh, now you may relate key suppose if you are simply uh, attaching a, a, a moving object uh, with this kind of thing so clamped right so clamped at this end and one end clamped at this right and when you are applying force and moment what will happen right so this is a general case and what happens then it, it deforms and maybe it will rotate right at certain so this is the point p you are talking about huh? so the the rotation so instantaneous rotation uh, you can uh, say so this uh, orange body will uh, move and then uh, it will as if it's uh, rotating at point p right so i think uh, from this this expression if you just uh, replace you say complete l capital l is the from uh, here to here and then a small l is the length for length of the flexure element and then you will be able to substitute and get these two expression from the previous slide right so what is phi and f but you also realize this body is relatively rigid so there is no deformation what you can see so f so f and phi are related eh? so f will be simply so displacement this f right so this is the deformation just because of this uh, flexure element so you can say phi x right and then you can also find what is the what is x eh? so x is the point from there from point b right where it's going to rotate right so uh, this this you try and what you realize that actually this point p is not fixed right it's a function of this l and uh, right so if you see here this point x right? how it changes so force f in b so suppose if you are only applying force f Mm -hmm. uh, at this point so what will happen total length so actually is now move to towards this point right so l capital l tends to a small l and then what you get is 2 by 3 l so actually this x is situated 2 3 from this so if i'm talking about this this l by 3 right so it's not at the midpoint if it, there is a force applied, right? But if L tends to infinity, what happens? You talk about a bending moment, a moment working. Mm -hmm. So when L tends to infinity, load is moment only. And in that case, so if you apply pure moment, then this point moves towards L by two. L by two. So depending, so it depends on the nature of force so this is for f and this is for m so what is varying between l by 3 to 
L by 2 from this end. So very much is located. But it, knowing this fact, actually, it gives you a very good uh, idea that, OK, for uh, any kind of simpler application, you don't have to even uh, design a, a, or put a revolute pair, but just uh, sheet flexures or any cantilever kind of thing can work. So uh, what you also realize that in this case, if it's moment, then more or less the the point of rotation is somewhere uh, tends toward L by 2 in the middle middle of it, right? Because of the force, that point moves, right? And there might be some uh, deformation F as well, so rotation and uh, both together. So uh, general idea is when you want to design, wh what you try to do is you try to uh, apply moment only and then the force so the force you try to put in the longitudinal direction because in the longitudinal direction if uh, if you apply a force here in this direction if you apply force actually uh, this will be loaded in axial direction and then the stiffness is much higher so it's a constant direction so the deformation will be really small because the stiffness are high the stiffness is high here along this direction and that also tell you okay, what what should be the orientation of this uh, cantilever thing. So this this flexures if you want to put in the design because you can also say why not like this right? What's wrong with this? I can also design like that right? So whether it has to be like this or like this right? Which one is better? And it's completely gone by F right? So, if you have a dominant load acting in your system, and suppose you know the direction, then what you do, you place it in this direction. Uh, so, the, suppose this is the dominant direction, then you orient your flexure along that direction, and the, for the bending moment, it will take care. So, for bending moment, more or less, it, it, it acts at the, at the middle point of the flexure. So, it can rotate at this point, right? So uh, that's very nice. Uh, similarly, uh, what also happens that uh, if you uh, if, if if you will apply a load, uh, there will be deformation, right? And then uh, uh, what will be the stiffness in in those directions? So, for instance, if you consider this uh, this this configuration if you take fz and fy you apply so fy is in the longitudinal direction so a stiffness is mainly because of ea by l area of cross section and the length right length of the fracture but you also realize that uh, so fy is uh, is the constraint direction fz is the, your compliant direction but the way it's done here so um, more or less you are applying at the middle of this point Milling middle of the fractures through this, and here is a 12 EI by L cube. Actually, you can uh, use a normal bending equation and you should be able to derive it again here. And what do you realize that basically this is the compliant direction? Mm -hmm. Compliant direction, and it's called uh, uh, line of compliance. So you apply, you apply the load here, and you get the deformation here in the same direction. Eh? So there are no parasitic or there is no rotations in this case. So that you can check. Okay, if you apply this Fz at this point, L by 2, uh, what will happen? So what will be the equivalent bending moment you try to find and put in these equations and you should be able to derive the relationship. So here you will find that, that there is no rotation if you apply force here. If you apply somewhere else, there will be rotation as well. What happens if you have two? So if you uh, like uh, attach it with the two uh, flexures in orthogonal directions, right? So if you apply any force F, there will be displacement. Eh? 
and this displacement can be in a, uh, maybe in different direction depending on this uh, cy or C, uh, cx because cy or maybe if both are equal then only you will get in the same direction otherwise the force direction and the displacement direction may be different depending on these two stiffnesses uh, for uh, one case here uh, you can uh, put in effects uh, decomposing to fy fz and this is the dominant load and so this is general con configuration and what you say that it rotates here right and okay along fy you can have uh, this and fz you can also have in the perpendicular direction so you can have uh, different flexion in different directions <clears throat> so this is just a uh, um, uh, derivation to show you that uh, uh, this direction and this direction they are not same and uh, it also depends on this stiffness so if if the flexures right so uh, you have the stiffnesses cx and cy at this point so connected through two springs so uh, this can be equivalently uh, replaced with uh, this kind of nomenclature and uh, uh, so that you can uh, do the calculation what do you and what do you realize what, what is the force components acting in different directions and then you should be able to see. Huh? So what happened that F alpha, huh? this is the, uh, if you are applying force, this is the displacement you get, right? Uh, and th this is not same alpha, the beta is a different here. So you will get from here. So what happens, uh, you can equate them and uh, they are equal only if if cx equal to cy equal to c so again in the principal direction is very much easy along the f0 this f by cx and in f5 by 2 is mainly because of this so in principal direction you will get so it's more like a elliptical deformation but if you have this case so what will happen here cx and cy they are equal and they will come out so f by c and uh, whatever is in the bracket actually it will be one only so it's just f by c right so cos square alpha plus sine square alpha equal to one right so it, it's f by c what do you also realize that alpha is no more in the picture it means it's independent so it doesn't matter right so what do you realize that if if it's connected and then you are applying a force so the displacement will be given by f by c and independent of alpha and beta and alpha so they are in the same direction right so what it also says that it doesn't matter if you have this configuration no matter in what direction you apply the force, you will get the same stiffness all the directions. So actually, you, you will get the same stiffness no matter what direction. So if you apply force F, it will be again C. If you apply F, you will get C. C. If you apply F here, you get F and C, right? So it's the same. So if I, I just uh, enclosed it and conceal it, actually you don't know that how it's connected and where is whether it's just because of two orthogonal springs right so uh that's the beauty of this kind of arrangement so it doesn't matter how you have as long as they are in uh orthogonal manner you'll get the same stiffness radial stiffness we would say in all the direction so generalized formulation so what happens if you have a object and then connected with the two flexures l1 and l2 and rotating at point p right and uh, this is a general case where it's uh, like a uh, uh, section of it is a uh, rigid and then only part of it so l is uh, your flexure member and uh, a by a dot l so it will be higher than one and then in that case the rest of the part is rigid part so this is rigid. it's not deforming only this part is 
deforming. So what happens? So your point you have already uh, placed it. So it will rotate at that point, but how will be the deformation, right? And if you want to do that, then you very much you will be able to get this kind of formulations. So what will be the stiffness, uh, torsional stiffness? And this is M phi by phi, right? So if you apply a moment M, and uh, phi is the deformation, then this this will give you the rotational stiffness. And uh, uh, I think these are uh, just a formulation, basic formulation because of L1 and L2. So there are two, two springs acting, right? And they are in parallel. So uh, you will get, and then, okay, here uh, Kz is E by EI, so because of the, um, bending and the other is because of the right so i think uh, uh, these are uh, all from uh, mechanics of material and you don't have to remember whenever required uh, that will be provided uh, but uh, if you really want to know how exactly to get it of course uh, please derive it and uh, make sure uh, you get it right? otherwise we can discuss it so we can uh, get uh, different kind of uh, designs. And uh, so here we are talking about just one flexures, right? One flexures in this case, or maybe just this one. So we know the limitations, right? And we have to know the directions, but we can also place two mm, in orthogonal direction and we can get a very symmetric design, symmetric cross flexure. Uh, what if we have to remember that they are not connected in the middle, they are not connected. Huh? So if you connect, it will be very different. Huh? Here uh, you can see it deforms. So this point P moves huh? and uh, it, they are not welded. So moment is uh, welded, is connected, then the behavior will be completely different because the length, effective length is very different. Here is L, but here L by 2, right? So in this case, what you see here is L by two, uh, if it's connected. And uh, the way it behaves is very different. And uh, this is one of the way to show that the stiffness, uh, if it's connected, then it's way higher. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be just aware. Okay, here there are two springs, length L and two springs. Here you have one, two, three, four, four springs for a spring and L by two length. So the uh, stiffness will be much higher in this case if you're, you're doing that. Of course, this is also a design because uh, it's a more, uh, it's a 2D kind of thing. So uh, then you don't have to worry, but once it's uh, connected, you have to be aware of the stiffness calculations. Of course, when we go for uh, this, uh, uh, cross flexures and uh, increase the depth, then uh, these cantilevers can be like uh, shit flexures then. So it, they have certain width. And okay, from side, they look like this, but from other direction, if you see, they are like uh, one is uh, horizontal and one is vertical and then placed it. But you realize here, you don't have to worry about the dominant direction because it, it can be always resolved and it will be taken care by one of them and then you will be only with the rotation part but still this is called non-symmetric although from side both look same right but this is non-symmetric and this is symmetric design and uh, again there will be a, a, a big difference in the stiffness so here uh, because of the eccentricity here uh, what happened? One of the one of the this section is W by two, so you will split it in half and then put on the either side, and this is W. So what you say is a symmetric design, and uh, there are a lot of calculations. So maybe I think uh, we stop here, and uh, I'll continue. Uh, so let's continue here. Uh, I think uh, this slide might be uh, better. Uh, here you can uh, understand uh, when we talk about the symmetric and uh, non-symmetric design. So cross flexures we are talking about. 
And uh, here, uh, what you see here is uh, two sheet flexors or lift spring, we call it. And they are uh, arranged in a cross, right? So, but in attached parallelly, right? In parallel. So, uh, one is uh, fixed to the base, one ends, and the other end fixed to the moving member. And if you apply a moment, then there will be corresponding rotation. So, very much uh, you can appreciate here. But uh, there are different embodiments. Huh? So, this is one. The symmetric one is. Uh, this design so this is the symmetric part so what you did is you split one of the spring one of the lip spring so what you have here then move it to other side so the length at uh, the width is uh, half of the, the center one so this is symmetric and this is non-symmetric uh, usually people also like many times they connect them so we are talking about this case where it's connected so moment you connect it has a completely different performance and that you have to be aware of uh, so we'll take up uh, but uh, all of them uh, this non-symmetric symmetric and this uh, attached one blue one uh, or welded one i would say they all have been the stiffnesses and uh, even the Stresses value will be different. So the behavior is a different, although they all can be called cross flexures. But you have to be aware if you are using them in your design, you have to be aware which formulation to use and what are the limitations. Right. So this is uh, just another uh, illustration. So you have a sheet flexures, it bends. Then you uh, like uh, you connect them, and then how it bends, and if you don't connect them, how they bend, right? So uh, I think uh, you can check it from here. So this one we discuss. This is what we are talking about. So this is uh, your uh, non-symmetric one. So I think uh, much better. Now. So this is a compliant direction. This is mainly the rotation part we are talking about. Right, so the two embodiments, non-symmetric and uh, symmetric one. So this kind of things you can build. So this, these are something you can uh, just uh, make it and we can do 3D printing and you can check yourself how good or how bad it is. Yeah. So how to show, yeah? how to know that the symmetric and non-symmetric design, how they are different. Yeah? And just to show that, uh, let's consider one of the lectures or one of the seat and in bending. But now we are talking in the constraint direction. We are talking about these forces in constraint direction. The shape is like this in the vertical plane. So it, it's in the plane, plane of the direction of plane, uh, plane of the paper. Eh? The low is also loaded in the in the plane apex. So it's a constraint direction. But uh, instead of uh, applying FX at the neutral uh, axis, it's a slightly offset. So it's offset by A from the center, from the neutral axis. So what will happen in that case? So what happens if when you apply this force here, what will be the equivalent? So equivalently, you will do, there will be a force FX here, acting here, and there will be a moment also acting here which fx times this a so one actual force right so actual force will give you this right and then you have this bending moment sigma b right so sigma x and sigma b because of the this bending load right so you can see it's, uh, it's the loading is not same uh, as if it's uh, at the center. If it if it's acting at this point, there will be only FX acting, but there will be no uh, moments acting. But moment you have there, then it will, it will have different displacements. So talking about X at this point where the force is applied, what will happen? 
One is because of the axial deformation, so Fx, L A by, so it's uh, Fx divided by the stiffness, so A by L, right? So it's uh, because of the axial, axial deformation, and then this is the other part is because of the bending. So if you have the bending moment here, so there will be rotation, and because of rotation, there will be displacement x. So a square l and fx divided by ei. So this is because of the bending moment. So this is the component which is uh, posing problem here, or which will change the behavior. Huh? So usually when we talk about this thing, we only consider this part, but this is quite significant. So, when you uh, just uh, normalize it with respect to the stiffness along uh, this along the axial direction, which is A by L, right? So, 1 by C, C by A. Actually, what you can write is L E by A, so it's a compliance in A, and uh, this factor you are getting. And when you make a plot, but you find that this is the normalized a by h the width, right? Because it, it may not be a shift flexor, it can be a rod also, right? Circular rod. Uh, if it's prismatic, prismatic, then okay, it's the just the height. But if it's something else, then so this is the number you are talking about, h prime, h star. So once you have, once you do that, what you will realize if this a value is higher, this offset value is higher. What you are getting is the stiffness is dropping very drastically. If, if it's along this line, this is the stiffness you are talking about, which is actual stiffness. As you uh, as this changes, if you move along this with this offset, actually is going very drastically, right? And if you are here. Even the half the weight, right? It's too much. If it's the same weight, you see. So the stiffness, change in the stiffness is way, way higher. Right? So the what you get is for a beam with a square cross section and tensile force with an eccentricity a by h 0.5 means. Even if you are working at this edge, at this point, even then the stiffness has dropped to this level. Hmm? The tensile stiffness drops by a factor of four, hmm? almost 0.25 you can call it. Right? 0.25, so fourth, right? one fourth. So it drops by a factor of four. So you see all that. So, moment you go for uh, these two designs, if you see here in this case, what's happening when you are applying a force here, you are applying on the edge, right? On the edge. But when you do uh, just change it to this configuration, actually, it's a symmetric. For this one also, and for this one also, it's a symmetric design. And that's the reason the stiffness is uh, for symmetric. Yeah. It's assumed that you will get this stiffness. So maybe hard to believe, but I think it's to uh, work uh, work on them and maybe also try to do some FEA to uh, understand whether it's uh, whether it's true, right? One thing you also understand that uh, two uh, cross flexures is always over constraint design, right? So, because you have 3C here and 3C. 3C and 3C. But 3C plus 3C gives you 6C. Huh? But it doesn't constrain all of them. All right? It's not equivalent to 6C. There is one, uh, one DOF always there. And that is the intersection point right intersection uh, means a line of intersection so wherever the two planes intersects that is that is where it can rotate 
and the over constraint is along the same direction. Huh? So it, it is a constraint twice by the two, two sheet structures. So we have talked about it. So it's over constraint design, right? So if you are looking to resolve this issue, how we have to do? We have to get get rid of one of the constraints. So over constraint are like it constraint twice, right? This translation. So suppose one is because of this one and this two, right? So one is enough. So two want to get rid of, right? So what we did, this translation is equivalent to a one rotation here, right? So if I, I, I just put a, a, a rotational degree of freedom at the other end, actually I can get rid of this constraint. Uh, 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 translation constraint along this line. So I just attach one cross. So it's this configuration, a star configuration, and it's a torsionally compliant member. So one end is fixed, the other end is you can twist. So it, it gives you the uh, rotational degrees of freedom. And that's how you can get, uh, get rid of the translation constraint at this axis. So that's very important that rotational translation is always related. Uh, what are the other ways, uh, simpler ways to uh, get this kind of uh, cross flexures, right? And uh, a very nice example is uh, again from Phillips. So they cut it, cut, and they got two sheet flexures, right? Cut in this shape, I shape, and this. Uh, C shape, and uh, what you will be able to appreciate this this vertical one. I call it one, and this is two. So just try to make solid works. These these are kind of lab problems I, I'm asking you to do. So for one, actually, it's a place here, one and this two. So one is just placed here, and then. You have the split pins inserted and then you will screw from this side so tighten uh, so it's clamped same way here from this right and you have c shape so you can just uh, round about take a round about and then place it here so you clamp this end here from this side you clamp this edge uh, this edge from this side so it's a sandwich here and you see uh, how effectively you can get a, a cross flexures just by uh, just doing a little bit of uh, your mm, some uh, innovations, huh? some innovative idea. Uh, very nice example. So it's uh, again over constrained one using lip springs or sheet flexures. So I'll cut it using sheet flexures and call it or many times it's also called leaf spring of course you know it's uh, over constraint design if you uh, have to design exact constraint then you go for you can also design using uh, pins or bars huh? so why so I'll call it wire flexure. So uh, very difficult to visualize, but I think what you are, how you get it is like two crosses and then one placed here. So like one, two, two wires, then again two wires, and then you have one wire. So total five C. And what what happens? You get rotation along this line. So this is how it's placed: two cross here, two cross here, and then you have longitudinal one, and again two and two and one. So it's going from A to B to C, right? And that's how the C can get these two rotations, right? One along this axis, and one along this axis. So you get two rotations. Right, but how to put them together? And what you find that 
uh, it's not easy if you have to put it but uh, somebody has designed it very uh, nicely and uh, so uh, you have to clamp the process four and then uh, along the axis you put again one one wire flexure and similarly you do it here but the assembly is it tedious unless you know how it's done so how they do it is they just make and make a hole first bigger holes all around it right so bigger size hole one two three four now all got connected right so bigger bigger hole so you, you, you just have one two right so you place the board hmm? next is you again uh, have the holes to uh, put the wire flexures. So these holes you make and then you also tap it, right? So here you can see the tapping in the first one. So here a screw, thread, a screw, a screw. Huh? That's how you are going to place the inner one. So again, it's like this. Now you will start putting the wire. So you put it and clamp it, all the crosses. And uh, for the inside one, what you see is you also insert it from this side and then yeah, this is fixed to this end and this end is fixed to this end. So you've got this in, in place and again you've got this in place and these crosses also got in place. What's the next? Well, they still repeat it, right? So the next is you just machine it out because you have to just take out this portion from the either end so once you get out of this then so you just machine it from both sides and you get the mechanism so very clever design i would say but somebody should come up with this and uh, very nice uh these days uh you can get even commercial uh, flexures so these are cross flexures and these are parallel guidance so parallel guidance We'll talk about later. One very good uh, uh, application and uh, uh, how it works is uh, you can uh, use uh, uh, this uh, injection molding to get out of plastic. So you can make very uh, inexpensive products. So any any flexures, any hinges you want to make, you can very much get it just by uh, putting the uh, smaller sections and you can make uh, cross hinges. Eh? So uh, again here, what you have to con uh, consider is through injected. Eh? So it should move from one side to other side. It should, so the the fiber, eh? the polymer, polymeric chain, eh? there, sh there should not be a rough chain there. And, uh, how you do is you inject from one side and you you let it pull on the other side and not at the hinge. You can get a symmetric design also, uh, cross flexure you see, and again it's a symmetric. So maybe hard to visualize, but then uh, I'll uh, ask you to make the, just give me a second. Uh, coming in five minutes, I'm in lecture. Yeah. So uh, the, the symmetric design you can make, and uh, again it's uh, made out of plastic to injection mold. So this is like uh, one uh, like uh, indicator, uh, station scale indicator you can make, and this can be out of just uh, plastic uh, to injection molding. And what you see here is you can go like this. Uh, the upper example is good because by the time it comes back. You, uh, there will be a junction here and it will fail here so that that is not acceptable so what do you do you start from here and you you put a cut in the rigid section so that it 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 goes it goes like this huh? so at the hinges there is a continuity right at all the hinges there is a continuity and here then it will work 